The Struggle for American Independence, Episode 1, The Thirteen Colonies. Welcome back to the course. I think it is imperative that before we go into the depths of the clash between the American colonies and Britain, we do a analysis of the different 13 colonies that eventually made up the original 13 states. Because, as we'll learn here, the different colonies represented vastly different cultures. Sometimes different influences came into their them. Um, sometimes they had many differences, more than similarities, and that's what we want to articulate. So first of all, let's talk Virginia. And when I give the founding dates, some of these dates are going to be kind of, not controversial, but sometimes uh, disagreeable because sometimes people consider the date the first time a settlement was created. Sometimes they consider the founding date the first time that a charter is received from a government. Um, some people consider the founding date the first time the colony becomes a royal colony, meaning that it was directly beneath the crown. But for the purposes today, um, we went with uh, some traditional founding dates, usually when it came to charter-based uh, dates. Virginia was founded in 1607 um, after a failed attempt by Elizabeth I to establish the Roanoke Colony in the late 16th century. What happened there was the Roanoke Colony, after receiving supplies for a time period under the crown, ceased to exist, and there's many different theories about why exactly that happened. Some people think that the colony was susceptible to Indian raids. Some people think that the Spanish conquered it. Uh, and there's other theories that have been postulated, but that's not really uh, pertinent to today's discussion. In 1607, the London Company founded the first permanent English settlement in Jamestown, named after King James I, who was the king at that time. And shortly after settling Virginia, and by the way, the first few uh, years were tough ones, the House of Burgesses was formed. The House of Burgesses was Virginia's elective assembly, the legislature of colonial Virginia. And the House of Burgesses lasted essentially until the time in which Virginia became a state in 1776. Uh, Virginia was largely controlled for most of its history, uh, colonial history, uh, by an aristocracy of several dozen families that owned most of the land. In fact, about 80 families owned a vast portion of land there. And that tradition kind of continued, and there were several uh, royal precedents and legal maxims that caused that, namely primogeniture, where the oldest son would inherit all of a family's property and entail where it was legally impossible for uh, the, a family's property to dis be distributed amongst people in that family. The chief economic trade was tobacco farming. After John Rolfe first successfully cultivated the plant, it became known as the biggest cash crop in North America, essentially. It is what led to the richness of the Virginia aristocracy itself. Virginia's established church was the Anglican Church, and that church took root strongly in Virginia, much more strong than the other colonies that had an officially established Anglican Church. Massachusetts was founded in 1630. Of course, it was settled before that by a group of English pilgrims that set sail on the Mayflower in 1620. Uh, the English pilgrims are oftentimes categorized as something of a homogeneous group, but really there were differences in the crew. The crew consisted of Puritan separatists who thought that the English restoration was essentially a job half done and objected to continuing Catholicist influence in the church and also other adventurers and tradesmen. They formed the Mayflower Compact en route to the New World while they were sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, and that has usually been considered the first governing document of the British North American colonies. Uh, it's very true that the Puritan separatists generally were trying to escape religious uh, 
uh, persecution in England as King James I was very harsh toward Puritans. Uh, the economic trade of Massachusetts was generally shipping and farming, and Boston was essentially a hub that grew to about a population of about 14,000, I believe, on the eve of the uh, Stamp Act crisis. So Boston was one of the biggest cities in the New World at that time, and it also served as kind of a trading hub. People throughout New England colonies would ship their goods to Massachusetts, where it would be shipped elsewhere. The established church was Congregationalist, and this is interesting because Massachusetts maintained its official connection to its established Congregationalist church all the way up until the 19th century. I believe 1833 was when it finally disassociated itself from that church. Also in New England was New Hampshire, found, founded in 1629. It was part of a land grant to John Mason and Ferdinando Gorgias. Um, it was first settled by David Thompson in 1623, and it really was established as an independent Puritan colony because uh, settlers from New Hampshire had some religious differences with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Charles II who was restored to the English throne in 1660, separated New Hampshire from Massachusetts in 1629 officially, issuing it an independent charter. However, it was definitely independently ran prior to that date. Its relationship with Massachusetts was often tenuous. There was often struggles between the two colonies over um, economic and land disputes. And like Massachusetts, its economic trade was primarily shipping and farming. Most of the England or most of the New England colonies have that in common. Its established church, much like Massachusetts, was Congregationalist. Connecticut was founded in 1636 by Thomas Hooker and John Haynes. Its settlement was part of a rift between the Congregationalist Church of Massachusetts and various dissidents against it. Anne Hutchinson was one of them who fled her verdict of the Massachusetts colony. She was a spiritual advisor that basically uh, embroiled herself into a controversy that put her at odds with the established congregation in Massachusetts. Early on in Connecticut, uh, there were challenges by Dutch colonists and Pequot Indians. In fact, the Pequot War was fought um, because of some of the disputes that are mentioned here. The economic trade of Connecticut, much like the other New England colonies, was shipping and farming, and it also had a Congregationalist established church. Rhode Island was founded in 1636 by Roger Williams, who's really kind of an interesting character who also was banished from the Massachusetts colony for... Uh, having theistic differences with the established Congregationalist Church there. He established a settlement independently in Rhode Island by buying land from Native Americans through mutually beneficial deals and voluntary deals with those tribes, then securing a charter from England. The charter was actually obtained through Henry Vane the Younger, who played a pivotal role in the English Civil Wars. And Roger Williams was really an interesting character. He really was a passionate advocate for religious liberty in a time where there was little in the entire world. Actually, his views on religious liberty made Rhode Island one of the places in the world where people were very free to uh, engage in free religious exercise that in other places in the world would have led to castigation, uh, ostracism, and punishment. He also was known for maintaining extremely friendly Native American relations. He believed in treating Native Americans fairly. He signed various agreements with Native groups in his region. And really, even though Rhode Island and Massachusetts often clashed over various differences, uh, Rhode Island maintained very good relations with many of the Native tribes. Rhode Island is one of the few colonies that never had an established church. Um, in addition to that, again, uh, 
religious liberty was embraced to a huge extent in Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island, more so than those few things, adopted an independent streak that lasted beyond the war with Britain. It was an interesting state in many regards, um, from refusing to abide by some of the colonial boycotts that had been adhered to by other colonies. Rhode Island also was the last holdout of the 13 colonies to ratify the Constitution much later. It really kind of did its own thing for much of the colonial history and most of the history of the American struggle for independence. Maryland was also a very unique colony in one specific way. It was founded in 1632. A charter was granted to Lord Baltimore, who was a Catholic, and the original intention behind this colony was to set up a haven of religious toleration for Catholicism, which had often, uh, which had often been uh, despised in England by the Anglicans. Anglicans all, often thought Catholics had engaged in uh, schemes to overthrow their government. Uh, for perhaps some of those were true, including in the bonfire plot where a group of Catholic radicals intended to blow up Parliament and install a Catholic head of state. Um, but religious toleration for Catholics was a pressing matter that really enveloped the entire 17th century of British history. Um, the Catholic King James II was overthrown in the Glorious Revolution, and there was often paranoia of Catholic influence in the country. It was an extreme minority in that country. So Lord Baltimore wanted to set up a haven for Catholicism. But unbeknownst to him, many Protestants actually migrated to the colony, many of which came from Virginia or other colonies. And actually, the Catholics were displaced, and the, Protestant, the Protestants, much like in Europe, established a majority there. Um, there was some religious strife, but a settlement was actually reached in the Toleration Act of 1649 where free religious exercise was uh, embraced, uh, much like what had happened in Rhode Island. Uh, the economic trade was tobacco in Maryland, much like in Virginia. Uh, many of the middle colonies did partake in the tobacco trade. And the official established church was Anglican, although unlike Virginia, that never really took root in Maryland and free religious exercised basically kind of encapsulated the religious inclinations of Maryland, although it was officially Anglican. New York was founded in 1664 by the Dutch, and the Dutch established a colony there called New Netherland. But the Dutch actually found themselves in various uh, conflicts with the English. Um, because of various alliance structures and various wars, actually, New York was awarded to England during the Second Anglo-Dutch War. Um, a very prized possession in hindsight, one that could not have been foreseen at the time. The charter was granted to James, Duke of York. Actually, the Duke of York would become the future James II, who was actually removed uh, from office in the Glorious Revolution where Prince William of Orange invaded at the invitation of Parliament and took the English throne. But it was the gift of his brother, Charles II. New York's first colonial assembly was created in 1683, and a colonial constitution was created in New York for the first time ever. Now, this is not to say that this is a charter. The charter was secured earlier, but a colonial constitution was uh, created for the first time, which really gave New York some autonomy that other colonies didn't have. Um, New York's economic trade focused on fur trade and grains, and the established church also was Anglican, although it did not take root like it did in Virginia. New Jersey, much like New York, was uh, once owned by the Dutch, but New York actually passed between several powers. It was founded in 1664, first settled by Swedes and named New Sweden. Well, it was then taken over by the Dutch, as I said, and then it was granted 
to England after a series of wars between England and Holland, the Anglo-Dutch Wars. The colonial proprietors encouraged settlements through land grants and the promise of religious liberty. New York, again, was one of the few colonies that did not have an established church. It really embraced religious liberty, unlike some of the other churches, um, like Massachusetts, that really maintained strict adherence to the Congregationalist Church. It would employ things such as test, oath, um, test oaths, which would prevent non-Congregationalists from obtaining civil office. Its economic trade was fur trade. The Carolinas were founded in 1670, and originally it was envisioned to be one singular large colony. Charles II gifted the land to eight nobles who helped restore him to the throne in what's known as the English Restoration of 1660, which had overthrown the English Protectorate, which had been established by English Republicans and Puritans, including Oliver Cromwell. After Cromwell died, his son Richard Cromwell uh, was briefly Lord Protector and then didn't have control over the country and notoriety or influence in the army and essentially this allowed royalists in the country to overthrow the protectorate and restore Charles II, the Stuart monarch, to the throne. North Carolina eventually seceded from Carolina proper in 1629 and really this was a first in a series of clashes between the two colonies but there was also clashes uh, insular clashes in both of those colonies in what was called the War of Regulation, which took place around the time that the colonies were first starting to come into conflict with Great Britain. And we won't get into that there, but it really kind of highlights and illustrates some of the internal clashes that came from different kinds of settlers in the colonies. Uh, because of class and profession disputes, uh, it wasn't always... Uh, roses in the colonies, suffice it to say. On the eve of revolution, Charleston was the biggest southern city. I believe it had about 10, 000, a population of about 10,000 on the eve of revolution, and it was a port city in South Carolina. It's still one of the largest southern cities today, and certainly one of the oldest. Uh, its chief economic trade were rice and indigo, and indigo was a type of dye that was used for certain types of fabrics, garments, clothing, etc. Carolina also had an Anglican established church in both North and South Carolina. Pennsylvania and Delaware were originally envisioned to be part of the same colony, and it was founded in 1682 as Pennsylvania, which means the woods. It was gifted to William Penn to clear out debts that the crown had owed to the Penn family, and the charter was perhaps the most liberal of any colonial charter. It gave Penn a huge amount of political autonomy in Pennsylvania, and it originally included land that became Delaware. That land was essentially known as the three lower colonies, which actually shared a governor for a time, but eventually Delaware essentially seceded from Pennsylvania proper and was allowed to uh, have its own colonial charter. It really happened that way because of inconvenience, logistical inconvenience, because there were times in which the Pennsylvania uh, representatives to the Legislative Council would have to migrate to Delaware to get certain permissions to enact legislation and uh, certain civil policies, and that really kind of inconvenienced them. And that was essentially the reason that Delaware was allowed to secede. Pennsylvania never tried to inflict uh, force upon Delaware for having done that. Um, Pennsylvania al also had no established church. William Penn was known for embracing religious liberty, like Roger Williams. And he also uh, was a Quaker. And even though he was a Quaker, Quaker was a religious minority. It was one of the types of theistic beliefs that emerged out of 17th century England. But uh, it really was unfeasible to try to establish a Quaker church in the colony because he had established religious liberty to such an extent. 
Pennsylvania and Delaware both endeavored to engage in the economic cultivation of grain, corn, and dairy. Georgia was originally founded in 1732 as something of an interesting social experiment. A charter was granted to James Oglethorpe, who envisioned kind of a centrally run economy where he would plan the type of growth of particular foods and goods. He essentially decided on a, a few different types of products that should be grown there, including silk, which really wasn't able to be cultivated there. Um, it was originally founded as a haven for those in prison for debt, um, in debtors' prisons, and it was very sparsely populated where it kind of remained so even throughout most of the revolution. It was actually very vulnerable, although parts of Georgia experienced a lot of what we would call guerrilla warfare in the war. Um, Early on, Jews also found refuge there, another religious minority where there was very few Jewish settlers, but many of them flocked to Georgia. Um, its economic trades essentially became rice, sugar, and indigo after the centrally planned economy that only lasted you know, a few years was replaced by a market-oriented economy that kind of endeavored to pursue economic gains through... Uh, the cultivation of crops that would be able to be grown in Georgia. Its established church was the Anglican Church. All of Britain's North American colonies shared certain commonalities. Among them was the existence of an elected lower house. This would be similar to that which existed in England in the form of the House of Commons, a generally more populated assembly that held most internal policy-making power over the colonies, including taxing and spending powers. So, the colonial subjects were taxed by the local assemblies. Um, because it was considered unfeasible to have Parliament control the internal matters of each colony, these local assemblies grew to hold most local policy-making power and were very much influenced by the will of the subjects in British North America. Most also had royal governors to enforce the law and to make civil appointments. As we discussed, all but four states had officially established churches. Those are Pennsylvania, Delaware, Rhode Island, and New Jersey. Other than Virginia, uh, most of the other Anglican churches that existed in the colonies did not really take deep root and were not as established as that was the case in Virginia. Uh, the colonies squabbled over land, access to waterways, and other resources. That was a very typical uh, point of contention through much of the colonial history. Some maintained very good relations with local Native American tribes, while others did not. For instance, William Penn and Roger Williams, as discussed earlier, were known for very amiable relations with local tribes, whereas in other colonies, they had to continually muster militia forces to deal with Indian raids, um, etc. All the colonies were taxed by British Navigation Acts, similar to what we would consider tariffs today. Um, Britain's mercantilist system established a system of trade regulation where you couldn't just cultivate corn and have it sold in Japan. You would actually have to grow the corn, ship it to England, and from there England would ship it elsewhere in the British Empire. You couldn't just freely trade with the rest of the world and Britain uh, regulated its trade through duties. In summary, each of the colonies had a relatively high amount of political autonomy. This point cannot be stressed enough, and it's really integral to the whole course of how the struggle with England develops. The colonies indeed were independent from England in so many ways that other places in the British Empire were not. It was so far removed um, from England that it really allowed the colonies to maintain a huge amount of political autonomy. Remember, the colonial legislatures controlled most of the po uh, policy that went on in the colonies, including
taxing, spending, um, adjudication of disputes, um, mustering militia forces, uh, etc. Most political policy was determined internally and not from England. This allowed the colonies and later states to develop distinct cultures, religious norms, governmental systems, mores, uh, etc. that really made each colony its own entity, its own polity. It was not a singular nation, not by any stretch. And what's also helpful to learn, as we will tackle in the next episode, is that British patriotic fervor spiked following the war over French in the French and Indian War, which culminated in the 1763 Treaty of Paris. After uh, Britain had secured victory in its classic uh, battle against its classic rival, the French, it, Edmund Morgan, the famous uh, historian, said that patriotic pro-British sediments were never higher. And indeed, that would be an irony because that sentiment did not last, as we'll come to find out.